We're going to be in the book of James, chapter number 2, this morning. James chapter 2. But before we do that, I'd like us to turn over to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter number 7. I want to refer to a passage here first in Matthew 7 before we return to James chapter number 2. In the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter number 7, our Lord says some very important things, especially saying something important about discerning the true spiritual condition of a person who might claim to know God, who might claim to speak for God, who might claim to speak of God, to discern the spiritual condition of a person who might say that they have faith. And so Jesus expresses this concern. He indicates that this discerning takes place as the fruit of a person's life is examined. And that the fruit of a person's life is really a better indicator of the true trust of a person in Jesus Christ, of a true faith, than one's own claim to have faith. And he says this for us in the context of dealing with false teachers in Matthew chapter 7 and beginning at verse number 15. The false teachers, as you would know, would be those who would claim to know God. They would be those who would claim to have faith. They would be those who would claim to speak for God and to speak of God. And Jesus begins in verse 15 with a warning. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So Jesus begins by saying that these false prophets are going to be among true believers and will be camouflaged. They will not always be readily detected by the sheep. They will mix well with those of true faith they will mix well because they will come in sheep's clothing. But they are, he says, they are detectable. They will inevitably give themselves away, but they will not be detected primarily because of their words, primarily by what they say, primarily through their truth claims or their professions Instead, detecting them will be more accurately done by inspecting their lives, by looking at the fruit of their living. So Jesus goes on in the rest of that section in verses 16 through 20 and says, You will recognize them by their fruits. Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Thus they will be recognized, thus you will recognize them by their fruits. What a person does, Jesus basically says, what a person does uncovers, reveals more about the person than what he claims or says he believes. This is the emphasis that we see now in our text as well in the, in the book of James in chapter number 2. James chapter 2, I want to begin reading in verse number 14. A passage that's not unfamiliar to us, but James 14 in reading down through verse number 26. James says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. 
Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see, that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. This emphasis then on whether a person has true faith or a person has um, a true confession or not is a concern that James has and has had as we've seen the last several times. We saw this concern, first of all, back in chapter 1 and verses 22 through 25. And and there we learn that merely listening to the Word of God, merely hearing the Word of God, is not a safe and sure indicator of true faith. Just sitting under the sound of the gospel doesn't prove anything about a person's genuine spiritual condition. True faith saving faith, the kind that saves, believes that God's, what God says and therefore does what he says. So being a word doer is a solid mark of the one who has true faith. Next we looked in chapter 1 in verses 26 through 27 and we looked at the person who claimed to be religious who claimed to be devoted to God and and sort of proved in his thinking that he was so by the religiosity, by his expressions of his devotion, of, of his heart. And what we saw was that a religion that did not affect the way that one lived was a religion that was worthless. So it is one thing to say, come to church and 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 put on a religious face. And it's another thing for that religion, genuine religion, to affect the way you live out your life throughout the rest of the week. So true religion, then, is the offshoot of regeneration and true faith in Jesus Christ. And it manifests itself in a wholehearted life devotion to God. The inner and outer life expresses a true faith and a true heart devotion to the Lord. And we looked at that, how the tongue is controlled and how charitable service is undertaken and that there was a resistance to conformity to this world. Along these same lines then, our passage today in chapter 2 stresses the importance of discerning true faith. Being a hearer and not a doer of the word is not enough. Thinking you are religious but having a lifestyle that remains unaffected is not sufficient. And from our passage in chapter 2 and verses 14 through 26, claiming faith but having only faith without works is simply of no value. So as we look at our passage this morning, it is true that it has been a source of trouble for some. Martin Luther, the great reformer, actually stumbled over this passage. He stumbled over the first part of verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? And Martin Luther went crazy over that, calling the epistle straw. He stumbled because he knew that Paul taught that justification was by faith and by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, by the grace of God alone. 
He knew what Paul had said to the Galatians in chapter 2 in verse 16. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So for Martin Luther to know that truth and to stumble upon, if you will, chapter 2 of James, it just wasn't computing. There just seems to have been a contradiction then between Paul and James. And, and Luther stumbled over this apparent contradiction. And others over the years have stumbled over this as well. But we should know that there is no contradiction at all. Clearly, God does not contradict Himself, does He? Therefore, His Word contains no contradictions in what it teaches. So how do the, we then reconcile James and Paul? And that's what's important for us this morning. How to recon reconcile what James says and what Paul says. There's no contradiction. How do you reconcile that? And the answer is that they can be reconciled if we understand that the words that are used in common must not be understood in precisely the same way. For example, when Paul deals with the word faith, he's referring to a person's trust in the redemptive work of Christ which brings salvation for all who believe. He's talking about a faith in the atoning substitutionary work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He's talking about a faith in the Savior who died and was buried and rose again. James, on the other hand, is referring to a mere profession of faith. He's talking about a person who says he has faith. He's talking about a person who claims to believe in Jesus Christ. He's talking about what we might call easy believism. When Paul talks about another word, when he talks about the word works, he's talking about the deeds the unbeliever hopes will merit salvation, which are actually dead works. Or he is talking about the sinful deeds of the flesh. The works of the flesh are, and he goes on and lists them in Galatians chapter 5. Or Paul might be talking about the works of the Christian, which he further describes as being good. So he calls them good works. James, however, when talking about works, is talking about the outward evidence of a saved life. He's talking about the outward fruit of true faith. So that faith for James means more than just believing intellectually. Faith for James means that the person's faith actually generates action. Generates fruit. Generates work. So James is talking about an outward evidence of a saved life. Then there's a third word in the passage which is used in common, and that is the word justify. We see it in verse 21. We see it again in verse 24. For Paul, justify or justification is used, and get this, it is used in reference to God. So that when a person exercises faith in Christ for forgiveness of sins and salvation, he is said to be justified. He is declared, and that's the word to know, he is declared by God to be right before God. He is declared not guilty. Paul uses the word justify. It's in relation to God. James uses justified in reference to man. A person's faith is proven, therefore, before the eyes of man, or in man's sight, by his works. That's how James uses it. How does man see one's faith? He sees it 
by a person's works. So if you will keep those thoughts in mind, you can see that there really is no contradiction between Paul and James. There's no contradiction in God at all, and there's no contradiction in the Word of God in all that he teaches. Paul and James teach the same truth, only they view it from a different perspective. They view it from a different vantage point. They view it from a different angle. Now, as we look at our passage here in chapter 2, we can find it can be divided into three propositions. The first covers verses 14 through 17, and this is the first proposition. Faith without works is not the faith that saves. Faith without works is not the faith that saves. There is a kind of faith that saves, that saves the soul. There is a kind of faith that actually brings God's response of forgiving, cleansing, justification. And then there's a kind of faith that does not save. There's a kind of faith that serves no good purpose. And about this faith, this professed faith, James asks the question in verse 14, can that faith save him? The supposed person in verse 14 actually thinks that he has faith. And by the way, the supposed person could very well have been in that fellowship as it is the case in every fellowship. There are people who believe that they are saved who make a profession of faith in Christ Jesus who do not give evidence of that faith. And that's the concern of James. So there's this kind of faith that does not save. And, and so James asks, can that person, can that faith save that person? And the supposed person in verse 14, he thinks, as I said, he thinks that what he has is true faith. In fact, he even says he has it. Someone says he has faith, James says. But in this person's case, there's something about his faith that James implies. And it is that it is a faith that is lacking. Something vital is missing. It is not accompanied by works. It is not accompanied by works. He says he has faith, but this faith that he says he has does not have works alongside of it. And because this faith is lacking works, James goes on and asks, what good is it? It is a faith that is devoid of fruit. It serves no real practical use. Of course, again, the person thinks this faith to be the real thing, thinks that this is the kind that saves, but James implies that he's mistaken and that the faith claimed is deficient. It's deficient. It is so defective that the question again is asked, can that faith save him? And the anticipated answer from the congregation is no. That faith cannot save him. That kind of faith cannot bring the salvation. And so what good is it? And to press home this point, an analogy is given in verses 15 through 16 that illustri illustrates that mere profession of faith serves no good. Verses 15 and 16, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? What good is that? So James depicts right here, and, <clears throat> and we should get this, James depicts not just a, an average situation, but he depicts an extreme situation. And he does it to make his point about the uselessness of the faith claimed by the supposed person in verse 14. First of all, a brother or sister, he says, a brother or sister in the Lord is being pictured. This person is not a stranger. He's not an unknown entity in the fellowship of believers. This person is not someone who is an outsider. He's not outside the faith. 
This person is not an enemy of the church, but this person is a part of the family of God. And then secondly, the brother or sister is not a person who is really getting by. He's not on a salary which enables him to have clothes and food and shelter. And, you know, some people have to scrap by or have to scrap at everything to get by week after week, but they do get by. It's like one paycheck to the next paycheck to the next paycheck, but they are making it week after week. James pictures someone in a much more desperate condition than that. They are poorly clothed and they are lacking in daily food. If they had food and clothing, we could really encourage them to simply work on being content. That's what Paul says in 1 Timothy. He says, but if we have food and clothing, the basics, with these we will be content. So the Christian should work on being content with the basics if that's all that he can do, and if that's all that he has. But this is not the situation that James depicts. James presents the person in this analogy in, a, in, poorly clothing, in poor clothing and being inadequately clothed for whatever the season is and in real need of food. And he or she is a brother or sister in, in the Lord. So you get the picture? I mean, this is a fellow believer in desperate straits. And notice now what someone who says he has faith without works is like in verse 16. This person who says he has faith, being depicted here, says to the brother or sister, go in peace. Be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. In other words, he speaks a kindly farewell to the brother or sister in desperate straits. He does nothing to alleviate his brother or sister's suffering. Kind words in this context are useless. They're not only useless in themselves, but the one hearing them says, what good is that? Be warmed and filled. Go back out to the winter weather. Don't have adequate clothing. Don't have food. It's okay. We wish you well, brother or sister. And so James is asking, what good is that kind of faith which is devoid of works? It is merely a profession of faith and it is divorced from any practical good. That's what he says. It's really very much like the faith the kind of faith that we have seen over the past 50 years in evangelicalism, very much like what is called easy believism, as I referred to earlier. Easy believism went something like this, believe these certain truths about Christ and and pray this simple prayer and you're safe and secure and you're in. All you got to do is pray this, one, two, three, four, you're in. Now, it is possible that a person actually could be saved that way. But we know what took place during that time period when that was the approach. Multitudes would actually pray that prayer. Multitudes would be assured that they were saved. And multitudes would join the church and immediately fall away from the church. Or we might see it like this. Hey, raise your hand or come to the altar and repeat this prayer after the preacher and you're saved. And so we had the altar calls and And the altars were flooded with people who would come forward. And and we saw that in the early 70s and 60s and 70s and 50s and, and on. And so the effect was, our church roles were loaded with names, but many of the people who professed faith in that manner never brought forth the fruit of true salvation. Many actually fell away altogether, and if you were to ask them, surely they might say, yes, I have faith, but if you were to ask them and then begin to look at their life, it would become abundantly clear that it would be a faith without works. And James' question here is right on target when he says, can that faith save him? 
And the answer is given in verse 17. Faith, as the way James used it, a profession of faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It does not and it cannot express itself. It's dead. It has no life. It is not, brothers and sisters, it is not saving faith. It does not justify in the eyes of God. The faith that saves is a different sort altogether than this. In a given moment of time and in space, sovereign grace intersects a life in order to regenerate and transform the person. It changes the person at the deepest level. It changes them from a sinner to a saint. The person becomes a partaker of the divine nature. He becomes a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus by grace, through faith, in Jesus Christ. A new creation. New desires are present. New affections are within. Sins are forsaken. Affections are so set on Christ that the new creation in Christ seeks to serve and to obey His Lord. The new believer springs into action. So that the faith that is exercised by the grace of God begins to manifest itself in love for God and love for others, not a feeling of love for God and a feeling of love for others. Yes, there's an affection in both directions, but it is a love that acts out of gratitude for God, for the good of mankind, and to the glory of our great God. And that's precisely what we saw in our Scripture reading this morning in Luke chapter 19, verses 1-10, through 10, when we read the story about Zacchaeus. Remember, after the Lord goes home to be with Zacchaeus, you remember, Zacchaeus acknowledges Jesus Christ to be his Lord and instantly, instantly went about desiring to be generous to those that he had taken advantage of and giving to the poor more than what was required for him to give back. And the crowd out there says, oh, Jesus has gone to eat with sinners and Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. He expressed his faith in Jesus Christ. He calls him Lord. He expresses his faith and his faith begins to express itself in works as he gives to those around him and those that he had taken advantage of. Faith expresses itself in works. Works that are done, if you want to know a good definition in my thinking, good definition of good works or works, Works are done according to the will of God, by the word of God, out of love for God and for the glory of God. I know you didn't get that. So works, good works, are done according to the will of God, by the word of God, out of love for God and for the glory of God. So proposition number one in our text is, Faith without works is not the faith that saves. Faith without works is not the faith that saves. And with this, we have from James a second proposition. And that is this, one that we've been saying all along, works give evidence of the faith that saves. I say it just like that because I want us to be certain in our thinking that we understand that a person is saved by the grace of God through faith alone in Jesus Christ. So that works are not combined with faith in order to bring about the justification of God. Rather, works give evidence of the faith that saves. Works do not save nor are they combined with faith in order to save. They are proof of the faith 
that does save. So this proposition is supported by three arguments in our passage. The first argument James presents says that faith without works is unverifiable. Faith without works is unverifiable. If true faith, if true saving faith is present, then it gives off proof of its presence. And that's what works serve to do. It's kind of like those fragrant things that you plug into the wall and you walk by it, all of a sudden you're just overcome by this fragrance and you look around and, okay, and then you notice it plugged into the wall. Yeah, that's that thing, whatever it's called, that thing is giving off the fragrance. But, but you know the thing is there. So if true saving faith is present, then it gives off proof of its presence. Verse 18, James says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. So listen to the challenge that James presents here in in this verse. Show me your faith apart from works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So if you say you have faith, how does it prove itself? Without works that spring from it and are done by it. And the answer, it can't. You simply cannot prove a profession of faith without works. You can't prove it. Suppose you say that you believe there is nothing to fear in flying on an airplane. And you claim this because of the statistics which says that it's safer to ride in a car, excuse me, it's safer to ride in a plane than it is to ride in a car. And so you're very willing to get in a car. Even though the statistics say it's more dangerous to be in a car than it is to be in the air in an airplane. And yet, you never get on the plane. You say that the plane is safe. Question is, how can your faith in the safeness of that airplane be verified if you never get on it? Answer, it can't. Likewise, to say that you have been saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, but have no works that spring from that profession, makes that profession unverifiable. Faith without works is unverifiable. The second argument that James uses to show that works give evidence of the faith that save is, saves is presented in verse 19. And he says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. They tremble. They fear. They believe that God is one and they fear. And with this example, James argues that saving faith, saving faith, and listen, saving faith is no mere intellectual accepting of a theological proposition. You can grow up reciting the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and not be saved. You can grow up and be taught to believe in the truths that are expressed in those creeds and not be saved. Saving faith is no mere intellectual accepting of a theological proposition. Saving faith acts. Saving faith can be verified. Saving faith grows and matures. I want to look at those one one thought at a time. First, saving faith is, is not a mere intellectual accepting of a theological proposition. Now, James, you remember, he's writing to Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians would be familiar with some of the Scripture, the Old Testament, in typ- typically, and they generally believe the Shema, the, the creed found in Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And this, of course, is true. And it should be believed because it is true. However, one can believe a creed intellectually and it have no effect on that person's life. In fact, James says this is nothing better than demonic faith. Nothing better than demonic faith. Demons believe this and shudder. Yet there is absolutely, get this from the demon, there's absolutely no change in their nature. How do we know? Because their deeds remain evil. Their belief effects no transformation in nature or deed. It is a useless belief of a truth, of a theological truth. But the faith that saves, the faith that goes beyond mere intellectual assent and affects the whole person, shows itself through good deeds. It acts. It works. And to show this, James uses the Old Testament personalities, Abraham and Rahab. In verse 21, by faith Abraham offered up Isaac on the altar. God said, go and and offer up a sacrifice and offer up Isaac. And Abraham's belief in God was manifested by this action because he immediately responded and he obeyed God's word even to the point of offering up the heir of promise. Similarly, by faith, Rahab the prostitute in verse 25 was justified. She was justified in the eyes of the Israelite spies She was justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. So that Rahab's faith was expressed by her works as she identified with the Israelites and gave a friendly friendly welcome to the spies, according to Hebrews 11 and verse 31. So both the faith of Abraham and Rahab acted. Their faith worked. It also, as the text makes clear, justified them in the eyes of others. That is, the faith they professed was made manifest before others. Their actions, their works, proved their faith. Their faith was verifiable. And this is how James uses the word justified in verse 21 and 24. Furthermore, We can see from the example of Abraham that faith, true faith, is not stagnant. It can grow and it can mature so that it springs forth into God-glorifying works, into works whereby only God receives glory in a mature faith that he expressed. And notice how James says this in verse 22 and 23. He says, you see, you see, you see with your eyes, not that you understand, That's how we might say it. You you see, you understand? No. You see, you see with your eyes that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by, matured, perfected by his works. And the scriptures was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So God pronounced back in chapter 15, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And Abraham's faith proved itself in chapter 22 with a very mature faith, willing and instantly obeying and serving God, even to the point of offering up his son Isaac. This stands in great contrast then with faith without works, which does not give evidence of the faith that saves. Which points to the third argument by James, which supports the proposition that works give evidence of the faith that saves. Saves And his argument in verse 20 simply says that faith without works is useless. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? In other words, this kind of faith serves no practical or spiritual good. It does not serve others. We saw that back in verses 15 through 16. Be warmed and filled doesn't serve others, and it cannot save the soul of the one whose faith is only a profession, verse 14 says. says, Can that faith save him? So this faith cannot save and is useless because it has no works. It benefits no one. Works give evidence of the faith that saves. 
works give evidence of the faith that saves. The third proposition then in our passage also serves as a conclusion for the elaboration of the faith without works theme that goes on throughout this passage. And so proposition number three says faith without works is dead. Verse 26. Faith, uh, James says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Faith without works is basically hollowed out faith. It is gutted of any usefulness. It is lifeless and does not spring forth from a real faith. It is no good comes from it. It is divorced from the one thing that really gives it practical value. So what is James driving at then throughout this whole thing? What is he driving at? What does he want his readers and what does God want you and me to take away from this 13 verse discussion? Here it is. You want to take away? Here it is. He wants us to be rock solid on this that true faith and works are inseparable. Saving faith is not a faith that is alone. As Paul would say it, we are saved by God's grace through faith alone without a dependence upon works to merit God's favor. But as James might put the same truth, We are saved through faith alone, but with a faith that is not alone. A faith that expresses itself with works. So, ask yourself this question. What good works do you do? What good works do you do that you do not look to to merit God's favor. So what good works do you do that spring from your faith in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ? Brothers and sisters, that question means this. It's not okay for us to drift and not give deep thought to our condition before God. It is a question that says, think about your condition. If you have faith, you must have works. What are those works that manifest the faith that you have in Jesus Christ? What are they? Can you list them? Oh, no, I hadn't thought about it. That's the point. Think about it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the rich passage given to us in James chapter 2. And Lord, how many have stumbled over this whole issue. May your Spirit have made it clear today of what James means that a person is not justified by a profession of faith alone, but by works and how he means that. May you bless your church today, Father, in hearing the word in order that we may be doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen.